Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be giving you an update about the court situation in Keene. We'll also be discussing the TSA and internet logs. So that plus a whole lot more coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. And thank you for tuning in to a brand new episode of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. With you, as always, is Toby. And Nick. We've got a lot to talk about today. We are going to be getting into the update of the story we've been following about the, the courts here in Keene, New Hampshire, where we're broadcasting from, some of the activism that's go been going on, um, the arrest of Ademo Freeman, among others, as well as banning cameras in the court unless they have special permission a whole lot more we'll be getting into that also talking about the tsa and ron paul uh congressman ron paul dr no presidential candidate introducing an excellent bill in, d in the federal government that i'm sure will go nowhere that will kind of put the tsa in its place it's something that a lot of states have tried to do but been threatened with like no fly zones over their states if they went through with the legislation so we'll be getting into that as well as uh, some stuff about internet logs big brother type stuff um and more uh coming up but first uh, we've been covering the story for a few weeks, uh, commentating, I should say, on a story for a few weeks about the courts here in Key, New Hampshire, where there's a lot of activism going on, a lot of people coming from all around the country to kind of, let's say, just poke the government with a stick. See what it will do if you don't play by its rules. I mean, honestly, that's what they're doing. Uh, most of them don't see the, any legitimacy in the court whatsoever, um, and so they're not really following the rules, so to speak. Little things at first, such as not standing for the judge or not taking off your hat in the courtroom um, that turn into much bigger things, I guess you could call them bigger things because they result in bigger arrests, uh, such as asking the judge if it's right to put peaceful people in cages if the taxpayers want to pay for it, which results in people being arrested and threatened with years in their life. Uh, years of their life behind bars. Uh, that was a Damo Freeman who last week we showed the video of him walking into uh, Judge Burke walking into the courtroom lobby and a Damo uh, was asking him if it was right to put peaceful people in cages, asked him three questions upon getting up to the second floor. Uh, he was arrested. Judge Burke said that he threatened him. Nowhere on the video did he threaten him. Um, and then a Damo was arrested and put into a cage for a couple days until he posted $5,000 bail, threatened with uh, Class B felony, improper influence, <coughs> excuse me, um, at which point uh, he was ready for his hearing and uh, probable cause hearing and the prosecutors, well, as we suggested they might do, dropped all charges because there was absolutely no basis for the claim that he threatened the judge because he didn't. Um, and then it's it's gone into a lot more. Well, it's been going on in the court yeah, as I mean, well. Th they've issued a new set of administrative rules for specifically for the Eighth Circuit Court in Keene. So what they're doing is they've they've said that there are special rules that need to apply to this court in Keene, even though they the court hasn't been able to keep order with the smaller set of rules, the more narrow set of rules that they already have. So I mean. I'm actually right now in the process of drafting a letter to the Superior Court because it's the, the Chief Justice of the Superior Court is the one who has one of the people who has administrative oversight over the court trying to ask them to uh, consider some changes and maybe we'll see if they don't get back to me or if they don't make some changes. I might see what the process is as far as uh, appealing that to the Supreme Court. So we'll see where that goes. Because the, the, the rules that they've put into place at this point, these new rules that you mentioned briefly, Toby, uh, they do require 48 hours notification to the court. Actually, you're asking permission. Um, and I haven't fully reviewed. There's a certain set of rules that go along with that. I haven't fully reviewed that 48-hour notice requirement. But essentially, you're asking the court for permission. So you're, it's, there's n nothing that I've seen yet that says that permission to videotape will be granted as long as you, you file notice 48 hours in advance. They've gone as far as banning photography and videography completely in the public areas of the court, which is a strange way to word it, but I think what they mean is everywhere that's public besides the courtroom. So the lobby, the other areas around the courtroom. And then they issued a couple more points. The, the fourth point I didn't really get because it was very, it basically just said people will follow the judge's directions, which is a power that the court already has. 
anything. Well, they're not doing well, anything. So maybe they're reminding people. I don't know. The other thing they're saying now is that if you have business with the court, you'll have to carry out that business expeditiously and then leave immediately upon that business being completed. Which is insane because I thought it was in a public court. And if you're having a public court that you can't stay at, if you're not allowed, if the public's not allowed to linger there after their business is finished and observe other trials, uh, it's just... Well, I don't, I don't know if that, that was the intention. But that's what it means, right? That's what it... How that's it? that's how it's how it's written is how it means. If, if you have a trial, or even if you're just handing in, you're you're handing in some piece of paperwork to the to the clerk, and you don't have a court date, the way it's written, it says you do it quickly and you leave. I think the intention might have been to say that if you're going there for a court, if you're going there for business, and that's your reason for business, you can't just loiter and hang out, which is there's a very difficult distinction to make between someone loitering in a contemptuous way and somebody carrying out their business, well, what if you're involved in a case where there's charges brought up against you and three of your friends? So you're not, and the charges against you are dropped or you're found not guilty. So even if the disposition in your case is you're not guilty, the court just wasted your time, more or less. You know, even if they throw out the charges because there was a lack of evidence to bring it in the first place, even if there was no good reason to arrest you, you're expected, you have to just leave and you can't see how the cases against your two or three friends work out. That doesn't make sense to me. I don't see how or what if you're how that qualifies as contempt. Sure, what if your case is over and you just want to observe other trials? Right, I mean, the... It, as, wait, you pointed, if, well, as you pointed out at the beginning... It's backlash for, because well, the, that, of the activists. Well, it's that, against the activists because it's only the one court it's been issued is for the Keene District Court yeah. where all the activism is going on. And the reason I know that this show is on all over the country, the reason we're talking about these cases in Keene and following them for weeks is because this would be going on in any part of the country, most parts of the country, could be even much, much worse if people didn't follow by the rules, play by the etiquette that's been going on in the courtroom and bow down and kiss the judge's feet and do whatever he or she tells you to do. The man in the robe is the king of the court and if you treat them any different, well, it will get a little bit medieval and throw you in a cage and that's essentially what's going on. This would happen anywhere, it's happening in Keene because people are standing up, people are moving in, uh, moving to Keene, well, New think, Hampshire from all around the world and I think, getting active I think this way. More troubling, the more troubling thing is what we're seeing, because as you pointed out at the beginning of the show, Toby, some people are coming to poke at the judge yes. with a stick. If, if that's your intention, then I can only feel so bad when you knowingly decide, like, I'm just gonna make, I am just gonna be contemptuous of the court. If you just stand up there and say the court's illegitimate and blah, 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 and you don't listen to the judge's instructions, and you're, you're pretty much doing the exact thing that the contempt of court powers were brought up for is if you're just going to be disruptive and say that the judge is the man in the dress and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that, I, you know, that's what's going to happen, is that you might get a warning and then you're, you're going to face some kind of a penalty. The concern I have is that because this has been going on, I think the, the judge who tends to preside over these cases is taking it rather personally. And I think the, the rest of the justice system is going rather overboard in their reaction to it. I think we're going to see overblown reactions where people are getting disproportionate sentences when they're engaged in that kind of well, activism. we've already seen that. And we've already seen the issuance of new rules that I think are constitutionally questionable at best. I think they encroach on everybody's liberty. And the effect of these new rules is not going to be to produce more order. If that was the intention of this new administrative order, it's going to backfire because well, you're, you're taking people, you know, the, the people who are engaged in the activism where they, they are trying to make a point and to some extent are trying to make a disturbance, well, you're just giving them more ways in which they can get arrested. And you're abridging everybody else's liberties at the same time. So I'm worried that what we're going to see, Toby, is I, I don't foresee the committed activists backing down. And at this point, based on what we've seen so far, I don't know how much faith that I have that the court system is going to back down or take a more reasonable, consistent tact. So mm -hmm. I think I'm worried that we're going to see more crackdowns by the courts that violate people's rights. And well, that's we're going to see gonna more see, activism, right. though, Nick. So it's I think gonna we're going to garner more people coming to Keene and poking the court with right. a stick. I think we are perhaps going to reach a point where it becomes a question of the administration of justice or a public trial. 
if if both sides keep going and they both keep upping the ante, then eventually you're going to reach a point where there are so many disruptions, well, when, so many repressive rules that at some point something's going to break. And I don't know how it's all going to turn out, but I think that's the course we're on at the moment. Well, effectively, they are taking away parts of the public trial by banning video cameras unless you or anybody who has business with the court has so to leave. And we've already after. seen the step in that direction. They're already halfway yes. down the slippery that's, slope. That's that's why and I think the reason the superior court. And I think one of the reasons for this is embarrassment. The a lot of the videos go viral on YouTube, on the internet, and they, a lot of them, some of them make the activists bad, look bad, but a lot of them make the court and the judges look really bad. Um, so I think that's a lot, some of the backlash is they don't want the bad press out there. Well, and that's another thing to consider here is that the case that's being made against having cameras because, well, they're, they're just doing this activism because there are cameras there. I don't think that's entirely true because there have been camera bans and people have still gotten, when there was no one videotaping, People, you know, activists are still going to do the same thing. So I don't think that's true. And in the case we saw where felony charges were brought up against the demo, th a couple of years of the guy's life might have been saved, you know, from, because from of riding in a prison cell because there was a camera there. The camera um, proved that right. the judge's claim that he was being threatened right. was false. Right. I mean, we're dealing with a situation here where it's, it's not just, it's, it's not just a matter of giving the activists an opportunity to film one another. I, I think when, you, when you've reached that point, when there's that kind of a crackdown or that kind of whatever you want to call it. It's getting scary. Right. Yeah, when the felony charges start yeah. getting thrown around without any apparently good reason, now you're dealing with a situation where I think for the benefit of the entire public safety, <clears throat> there need to be cameras in the courtroom. And I think it would be a public service to have a camera in the courtroom at all times. Yes, absolutely. Well, we will continue if we'll let you guys know what develops from this and continue talking about it. Um, definitely is going to be interesting. So continue tuning into shows and we'll let you know what happens. But for now, uh, we do need to move on. Like I said, we are on all around the country, not just in Keene, New Hampshire and other parts of New Hampshire, but all over the place. People watch us from around all around the world. So let's get into some other issues on the federal level. Something that we've been covering for, for years is the, the crackdown on freedom to fly uh, without getting molested um, in some way by the TSA officials groped, put through a naked machine, um, you know, asked to give away all your freedoms and liberties to get on an airplane. And uh, there was a huge public outcry initially, especially when the, the naked scanners and the groping came and then but they're still there everyone, everyone said, oh, up. I guess I'll go get scanned and groped. But you know what? Some people who actually believe in the principles of liberty and freedom um, are still fighting back. We've seen states try to uh, well, we've seen implement states come laws. Close. They've tried to implement laws that would... Well, I don't think there's a try. They, they could have implemented the law. Well, they, and they tried, and then they got threatened. They, what essentially they tried to do... That's what I'm saying. They say, could have implemented it and seen what the, made the federal well, government how, show their hand. Let's talk about what they tried to do. They tried to make it so that TSA officials who were groping passengers and touching their sexy parts could be charged with sexual assault. Um, Texas tried to do this, and the TSA immediately threatened a no-fly zone over the state, so they immediately backed down. Um, is this all just bolstering? I'm not really sure. Would they have done it? I'm guessing not, but who knows? So Texas said, oh, we can't do that. We'll back down. The federal government's well, there's blustered, and they backed down. But now uh, Ron Paul is talking about um, doing something similar on the federal level, and now I don't think this has any chance to pass. I think it's great to keep the issue in the news, in the spotlight, and you know, get a little bit more press on this issue because largely it's been dying down, but it's still happening. Still touching kids in their private areas, still touching old ladies, you, me, if we don't want to have naked pictures of us taken when we go through the scanner, you gotta be groped on, which to me is Take the quite train. the violation. And it's not long until, <laughs> no. like we said, it's not long until it's the train, the bus, the roving right. transport station. You've so. talked about such things. What we're talking about here specifically is the fact that Ron Paul um, introduced, he's talking, he's actually just announcing plans to reintroduce a bill um, that would basically, it would classify these invasive gropings or the naked body scanners as sexual assault. It's called the American Traveler Dignity Act. 
And it, I mean, as you said, Toby, I don't think it has a great chance of passing. It might reignite debate enough to get this issue debated in more state legislatures. I know I don't know if it ever made it out of committee, but it was debated here rather hotly in New Hampshire. Um, and unfortunately, legislation did not come out of that. The effort in Texas failed because you know the feds are making ridiculous threats. So, you know, when you start talking about putting no-fly zones over states. Um, because you know you're putting some pretty narrow restrictions on the TSA, it it should give some of you out there pause about the relationship that the states have with the federal government and the relationship that we all have as individuals with the federal government. There's they're pretty quick to threaten you and they're ready to make any state that varies ever so slightly in policy decisions from the federal government. They're ready to turn them into something like I don't know. Um, post Gulf War Iraq when they had the no-fly zones. I mean, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous threat to make. Um, I don't know, Toby. I, yeah. I, I'm hoping, hopefully this does lead to some changes. I uh, don't know how hopeful I don't know. I am. The more of the mainstream news coverage I've been watching is going the opposite di direction of they need to get more invasive because now the new threat is what if you sow a bomb into yourself, which we've been saying forever. If like, you really want to do damage, you can. And what's the point uh, through security I mean, a terrorist, if they were really all out there trying to sneak onto airplanes, if that, that was a real threat, I guess it's a minor threat, but if it was a real threat that we all should be worried about, we'd see them blowing up airports all the time. Not airplanes, maybe, but they'd go up to the security checkpoint if they don't get through, detonate the bomb and blow themselves up right, right there. That would create quite The a last stir. case was, I mean... The, the only crazy case, shoe bomber. The shoe bomber He's comes to mind. And the underwear lunatic. bomber. Another, Another lunatic. lunatic. <laughs> but you don't see anything. I mean, it's it's not a real threat such as the regular threats we have in life, such as uh, you know cancer or getting in a car accident or um, any uh, coconuts falling from palm trees. I mean, there are real terrorist threats in other countries, but here in America, there's no real threat. I mean, the amount of money that is spent on this farce is it's sickening and uh, just to see the american people get brainwashed to think oh we really need to be scared of terrorists getting on airplanes and blowing them up give me a break well, if they want i've said it a million times if a terrorist really wants to blow up an airplane they're going to take the years they're going to become a uh an employee at the airport and instead of trying to sneak through the gates with all the security guards they're going to become the the guy who throws the bags on the airplane and just load the whole belly of the plane up with bombs and blow it up that way i mean that's what i'd do if i was a terrorist but Good thing I'm not, I guess. Uh, but None of them have figured that out yet. You know, I mean... It's because it's not a real threat. I, I mean, I guess there is a threat that it could take place, it but... Is, there's also I don't a threat that I'm going to get hit by lightning or an asteroid would destroy the Earth. It's not a I don't know threat. that terrorists have any special commitment to hitting commercial airliners, and I, it's a very narrow way because... We're doing much at all, it seems. Right. You'd think something I mean, would have happened in the last 10 years. Right. I mean, we were, we were attacked 10 years ago with commercial airliners, and that's... I don't believe that the next attack that gets through will look anything. Well, maybe it will, like but that. even if you add up the, add the cost up benefit, the cost benefits, and go well, you know, if we were willing to spend a trillion dollars on cancer research, we'd probably save a lot more lives. If we were willing to char uh, spend a trillion dollars on car seats that would eject you from the car way up in the air <laughs> right before it got in a ca car accident and you could parachute to safety, well, yeah, you could do that. It costs a whole lot of money, right, right? And then to give put those in all the new cars, well, it costs money. Yes, but it could save all the people well. That's from some, car but, accidents. But that's something that people don't take into account is when you consider a, a policy like this, where the government spends a whole lot of money addressing one threat. You do have all that wasted potential of where the where the money could or just have been used. let us keep the money and not right. go into huge amounts of debt and not well, get into wars in other countries. And I mean. The debt issue is something we're going to be covering. If something's not done soon, it might be a major issue over the next few weeks. It's number so, one security I mean, threat there is. Right. And a lot of that debt was put there by the war on terror. And uh, it's probably the debt itself at this point is probably a bigger threat than terrorism itself. In fact, it's not just me saying it. The Joint Chiefs staff have said it. So. It's nearly a trillion dollars uh, a year. It's not just wacko me who says it now. Other people agree with me. People in the Pentagon agree with us. Yep. They agree with us, not like half or more of the American people who are just 
Well, retards. well, they <laughs> it's not their fault. They watch the TV and they see the administration I raise the terror alert and go, we got to be careful of these terrorists. And they go, oh, it's all emotional. And they got all flustered. Well, and they, they don't, the most dangerous thing you do every day is get in the car, car or eat that hamburger or smoke that cigarette or drink that beer or whatever other vice. Those are dangerous things. Those are what you should be worrying about, what you can immediately control. You can't control the crazy guy who's going to get on an airplane and blow himself up in the name of God. You can't, you can't protect yourself from that. If he's really determined to do so, he's going to get you. Sorry. Well, I think people like to talk about it so much because they can't control it. I don't think most people are really that stupid. I think it's more just... You talk about what you can't control because you know you could right. quit drinking all that beer. You know you could switch work. to eating yeah, salads really instead of hamburgers. To do that. You, you absolutely know that you could be a safer driver. You could invest yeah. in a safer automobile. You could get your you fire could, extinguishers yep, checked. You could uh, definitely do boring. all that stuff. That's boring, mundane stuff. But instead, you're glued to the TV. Oh my God, they raised it to an orange alert level. There could be some crazy terrorist that sews a pipe bomb into his fun, butt and he goes and blows himself up and kills three people. Oh my God, what if one of those three people is me? I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Get over yourselves. I don't think you're so important. Okay, moving right along. Speaking of debt, Nick, one of the issues is not just the uh, federal government that's gotten itself into a whole heap of problems with this terrorism scare and as well as the government bailouts. You know, all sorts of uh, demons to slay out there that can be conquered with money. It's also states that have gotten themselves into trouble. And uh, some of that is uh, one of those big states. So, well, it's pretty much every state. New Hampshire is no different. We have our own debt problems. But California, well, they just... They make it easy to pick on them and point out some of the issues. And what's going on in California is going on in other states, New Hampshire included. Just every, wherever you are, you're watching this. Um, there's, there's similar programs in California that are the re, one of the many reasons why uh, the debt problem has gotten so big. Um, Newport Beach, California gives cops $5,600 to wash their motorcycles. No, that's not every wash. That's every single year when they're washing their motorcycles. It pays to, uh, well to wash your motorcycle if you're a cop in Newport Beach, where officials who patrol on motorbikes are paid an additional six hours of overtime every month for giving their cycles a wash. The special compensation equ uh, equates to, on average, about a 5% pay hike. Uh, for motorcycle officers or about $5,600 a year in additional monies. That means they're making well over $100,000 a year to be a motorcycle cop. Wow. Um, I guess that's one of the reasons why California's going broke, and that's only one of the very minor. That's only a headline because they go, wow, they get $5,000 a year to wash their motorcycles? It only takes them a few hours a month and they get $5,000. Wow, that's amazing. Well, that's teeny in comparison to the other detail work they get in such as i don't know the last three years of their uh before retirement they go and they get triple overtime to work some construction detail and sit in an air-conditioned car and play solitaire all day uh, and then for the rest of their lives they can collect a pension that was equal to the triple overtime pay they were earning so they can retire earning a, a hundreds of thousand dollars a year to do nothing, sit on their pat, their butts, collect that pension. So, yes, this goes on that in California. happens just about everywhere, too. Yes, it's not just California. It's all over that the place. Here. It's just it, when you see a headline that goes, wow, motorcycle cops get over $5,000 a year to wash their own motorcycles. Holy crap. And uh, then it, the article goes on to talk about how California companies are fleeing California, fleeing the I Golden State. I can't imagine why. They say they're overtaxed, they're overregulated. Uh, they're burdened no, the by... taxes are about to go up. And, the, I mean, the California is in a position a lot like the, the position of the federal government where they're facing a situation where, in, in fiscal terms, the, the most sensible policy, when you remove any kind of ideology or morality out of it, is to raise taxes and to cut services. I mean, that's, in the short term, that's the best way to balance a budget deficit that's as bad as they're facing in California or on the federal level. Yep. So... That's what you're going to get. Yep. And what they're getting in California today is what we're going to be getting nationwide probably before too long. Now, many of these companies, of course, are fleeing to other states, but many more are fleeing to other countries. And then we see the United States start to just slip more and more and more. <laughs> I, think we started, I think we started to uh, slip in relation to the rest of the world. We're sinking. We're about halfway down. Anyways, who knows? I still say, and I've always said, well, not always. I guess I've come to say, 
get rid of the federal government. The states could do a better job yeah, and compete on that. their own. Yeah, you're right. There used to be a time where, really, when we did the Downsizer Dispatch, which I still think is great, DC.org with stuff like Read the Bills Act, Write the Laws Act. Um, I think that's great programs, but in all honesty, I've given up. I'd, I'd rather see 50 different states all competing for the right kind of government. And then well, I think, well, now we're getting into <clears throat> debating theoreticals. I don't think you're ever going to see the 50 states act completely independently. Oh, I think. But the idea, when the federal government is crushed over its own weight, Nick, we'll see. Anyways, I think we'll you'll get, see we'll them get something together pretty quick. Speaking quickly. of the federal government. There's a lot of good things about the federal government. Well, a few. Like free trade between the states and things like that. Free trade before, yeah. Oh, well, when you get across 20 borders to get to California, you, then maybe you'll reconsider. You, you think it's going to be that difficult? You don't think they're going to be... I think we'd adopt a free trade agreement a lot like NAFTA, which is what I'm saying. You'd still have a, you'd still have some of these institutions around. You just don't need a federal government to do it. Well, yeah, but they could all implement their own forms of government. Some big, some yeah, small. Yeah, I'm just saying they're going to talk to each other and work things out. Of course. Why wouldn't if they? If this happens. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you're kind of giving me the you think it's going to happen. Well, yeah, but, I, I don't think it's supportive. I don't think you can support a government that's that bloated, in that, right. m that bloated and isn't doing nothing about it. Anyways, topic for another day, and we did plug this last story that the federal, one of the other things federal government's doing, oh, yeah. you know, getting into your internet life, we plugged it, so I guess we got to talk about it. Yeah, a bit. Um, law enforcement officials, I guess specifically the National Sheriff's Association, says it strongly supports um, a new proposed law that would uh, require ISPs, internet service providers, to retain logs about their customers' activity online for 18 months. Currently, they're only regulated by a 1996 law that requires them to hold it for 90 days. Um, they want them to hold the ISPs to hold this information longer. The justification they give is it will make it easier to catch uh, child predators and people who are looking for child pornography. Of course, they don't just store those records; they store all of your records. Um, and we know the government's probably watching. You, you know, they're probably looking at your internet history right now. You know, sure. they're just trying to make it legal. I would think. Sure. I mean, since since the introduction of the Patriot Act and things like that. They can pretty much go to the ISPs whenever they want. And in most cases, the ISPs hand over the information without a warrant. So now the government's yeah. just going to ma make them hold a year and a half. And of course, of data I do want to point out. 90 days. Right. I do want to point out, Nick, that they're, they have not been using that data to catch terrorists. They have been using that data to catch people for downloading movies or music and stuff like that. It has not been. Uh, something that stopped anyone from from Yeah, I bet they read your emails up. too. I mean, sure, why not? To be honest. Of course, of course. You know, put people on lists, compile lists. You know, I wonder what it's like to be a federal <laughs> agent. You must really like compiling. <laughs> Those guys lists. who read the NSA must really. I love lists. Really lists have fun. of names. Well, I guess been. they get to find out all kinds of. Interesting it would have been good not. Oh, it's, it's probably fun. It's horrible, but I guess for the people doing it, it's probably a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, yeah. If you if you like putting people on lists. I guess that would be fun, Nick. If you would, if you can sympathize with the Nazis, you would have <laughs> enjoyed yourself being a um, government official compiling this. That's gonna do it for us. We'll be back next week with an all new episode. Until then, it's been Toby here with you. And Nick, FreeMindsTV.com. In the meantime, have a good night. Is Liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com.